Hi, I'm Semben Yaakov. This presentation is entitled An Introduction to Power Factor Correction and Control. The classical approach for rectifying an AC voltage was to use a bridge diode followed by a capacitive filter. This RL represents actually the load. Now, in this case, since the capacitor is being charged, then the current will flow only when the input voltage is higher than the voltage across the capacitor. So therefore, typically, we are going to see this is the current of the line, this is the voltage of the line, and only around the peak value of the voltage, we are going to see this current. Therefore, there is a lot of distortion here, of course, and this is the harmonic um, composition of this current, and as we can see here, there are many components of higher frequencies than the main uh, frequency of the line. Now, this is now forbidden in most countries around the world, and, and in fact, to design the equipment such that the current will be almost sinusoidal. Before going into the detail how this can be done, let me just define what is power factor, what we mean by it, so we can understand the problem on hand. Now, power factor is defined as the ratio between the real power and the apparent power. Now, real power is the first harmonic of the voltage, first harmonic of the current, times cosine phi, if there is a phase shift between these two. Now, the total power, or apparent power, is the voltage, RMS voltage, times the RMS current. Now, if the voltage itself is fairly sinusoidal, and there isn't too much distortion uh, in it, then VRMS will be almost like V1 RMS, so this can be factored out. And if we are dealing with a case in which there is no phase shift between the voltage and the current, then of course we end up with this relationship, which is the first harmonic of the, or the main component of the current, and then the total RMS. Now the total RMS is calculated by taking uh, the square root of the sum of all the components square, because this is a power summation, so you take the current to the power of 2, and this will be proportional to the power, and then you sum it up to all the components. Now, the power factor is related to another important uh, parameter, which is the total harmonic distortion. Now, total harmonic distortion is defined as the, actually, this would be the square root total harmonic distortion itself, so total harmonic distortion to the power of 2, and this will be the sum of all the components, the harmonic components of the current, except the first one, divided by the first harmonic. So this ratio tells us how much distortion we have in the current. If, of course, the current is not distorted, then this sum will be zero, so THD will be zero. On the other hand, if there is no distortion, then this sum will be only the first component, and therefore the ratio will be one. So power factor of one means that uh, there is no distortion of the current, while THD will be zero, and as distortion um, develops, then power factor will be smaller and smaller, and the THD will be higher and higher, according to these relationships. As I've already pointed out, manufacturers are required today uh, to make sure that the harmonics of the current injected into the line will be below a certain limit, and these limits are defined by this uh, standard or norm. Uh, this is an example. This will be the IEC or EN 61000-3-2, which specified exactly uh, the type of equipment that it relates to and the limits of the harmonics. The norm or the standard uh, defines three types, actually four types of uh, equipment. There's the Class A, which is the 
household equipment. This is just general type of devices that you'll find around, audio, audio equipment, etc. Class B is portable devices like a drill or arc welding, but this will be for consumer, not uh, professional use. So this type of equipment are not being used uh, all the time, so therefore the limits here are a little bit more relaxed. In fact, the limits here are 1.5 higher than the limits for the Class A that uh, we'll see in a minute. Now, Class C refers to lighting equipment. There'll be uh, fluorescent lamps, uh, PL lamps, uh, LED lamps, etc. And uh, because there are so many lighting devices around, uh, this uh, Class C really has a more tight uh, regulation, as we'll see in a minute. Now, Class D refers to personal computers, uh, monitors, and uh, this type of equipment. And, however, only if they are below 600 watt. For equipment above 600 watt, uh, we go back to the Class A. Now, all this norm, all the standard, uh, is related to equipment which is higher than 75 uh, watts. So, a device or a piece of equipment or instrument which is consuming less than 75 is really free of this uh, uh, standard. And also, it relates to currents below 16 amp, currents above 16 amp, actually belong to another group, which is industrial, which is a different type of uh, uh, standard. So, here is a typical table, or here is the table actually for the class A, and what we see here is the harmonic order and the maximum permissible harmonic current. So the third harmonic, it'll be 2.3 amp. Fifth harmonic, 1.4, etc. And for the even harmonics, there's also some limits. Usually, uh, if it's a balanced uh, rectification, you will not have uh, even harmonics, but still, if they are, then here is the limit. Now, 2.3 is a fairly high current. So if uh, uh, the piece of equipment is low power, say 200, 300, 400 watts, um, it's not that difficult to meet this standard because this is 2.3 amp, that's, that's quite a bit. So, uh, however, if the total power of the equipment is, say, one or two kilowatt, then of course uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult uh, to meet the regulation. Now, this is now for the class C, and as we see here, the, there is a difference. The limits are not defined as absolute currents, but really proportional to the first harmonic. So, for example, let me, let me take the fifth harmonic. This is 10% of the uh, first harmonic, of the major component of the current. So, uh, it really doesn't so it's not dependent on the power level for each power level will be 10 percent uh, here the definition of the third harmonic will be on it said 30 lambda and lambda is the circuit power factor so if the power factor is approaching one there will be 30 percent if the power factor is 0.5 then it'll be only 15%. And here it goes for all the other harmonics. Now the class D then is also defined a little bit differently. It is defined as milliamps per watt. So if it's a 100 watt uh, piece of equipment, then it'll be 300, about 300 milliamps for the third harmonic. And the absolute limit is 2.3, so even the power is very high, you cannot go above this, which is actually the class A. This curve here actually shows the limits. These are the values here. This is the third harmonic, this is the fifth harmonic, etc. Uh, third harmonic is 2.3, this is a, a logarithmic scale, and then we go uh, to the higher and higher harmonics, and this uh, line goes uh, a little bit down. Here we see sort of an example of uh, different uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, these uh, are all, 
all right but this one is actually outside the limits so it will not pass the uh, standard so how do we regulate the current and the input so that the harmonic distortion will be low this is a typical and a classical power factor correction circuit that has been used many years it's now being replaced by newer designs but this is really the main concept that has been followed uh, by many manufacturers so here we have a rectifier there's no capacitor of course here followed by an inductor and a transistor a switcher this is the boost converter now the boost converter is now controlled by feedback we'll talk about in a minute such that the current or the average current of this inductor will be half sinusoidal here it is this is the current of the inductor this is the voltage by the way that we'll see here after rectification with no capacitor we'll see just the AC uh, rectified so the feedback is responsible for forcing the current to be like this like sinusoidal rectified uh, sinusoidal waveform so therefore at the input we're going to see a full sinusoidal waveform as we need okay so how are we going to do this this circuit uses a reference for this waveform and the reference comes from here because here we have a voltage which is a half a uh, full wave rectification so we sort of divide it out to get a lower voltage and this is now the reference so we compare the reference to the current this is the same current that is flowing in the circuit we compare it to the current and when there is a deviation uh, the output of this difference amplifier the amplifier will produce a voltage with higher or lower than the nominal value and therefore the width of the pulses the PWL modulator will produce uh, pulses which are wider or narrower as required to regulate the current uh, to come back to the required value so this is the closed loop now as you'll see here there's a multiplier here and I've assumed so that this voltage is constant so we are multiplying this waveform here it is by constant voltage and we compare the reference uh, to the actual current forcing the current which is this current and therefore this current to follow this reference now obviously in this situation there will be one particular height or magnitude of this current now we need it to change because we are going to change the load and for different load we need different input current so this is done by looking at the output comparing it after division to a reference and whenever there is a deviation this voltage will change as it will change it will multiply this reference by a higher or lower value so as to adjust the magnitude of this reference which of course will force this current to follow this reference so we have a closed loop here a negative feedback a reference we compare the current to this reference and we change this reference as required by the output voltage so if the voltage goes up then it'll lower the reference etc so this is the classical power factor correction circuit uh, which uh, of course is controlled by this part here and um, you can find of course uh, this is as a IC chip controller that will do all what is required for this uh, control operation there is another way that is also very popular and this is called the borderline control method there are actually two types of borderline control and I'm first showing the one which has been first came out in the market which is let's call it the conventional one now here the waveform of the current is with a very high ripple in fact the current of the inductor goes from zero to a given value and then back to zero 
This is in contrast, I haven't said that, but here the ripple of the current will be fairly low in this uh, power factor correction circuit. That is, uh, we're going to have some ripple, of course, depending on the size of the inductor, but uh, it is controlled to be, say, 5, 10 percent of the total current. Here, I, however, in this borderline, we are going swinging from zero to a maximum and back to zero. Here it is. These are the current, this is the current of the inductor. Obviously, the frequency, the switching frequency is much higher. This is just for illustration, the figure here. So, we have these triangular waveform of the inductor, and since it is a triangular, the average is halfway. So, this is the average. So, in order to get the given average current, you have to control the peak current, okay? So, again, we're going to have a reference here. This is the reference. Again, this is a sin rectified sinusoidal waveform. Here it is. We compare it to the current, and we force the peak to follow this reference. Okay? Now, how this is done, we detect the zero here. This is zero detector, and as we detect the zero, this flip-flop is turned on, and it sends the one to a driver, which drives the switcher to be on. So we are on this part here. We started with the zero detect. We go all the way up, and as the current goes up, eventually it'll hit the reference. This is now the reference. This is the reference coming over here. And once it hits this average, this output will reset the flip-flop and the transistor will turn off. So then, of course, we're going to have a uh, discharge of the inductor uh, into the load. Again, since we need a regulation for different type of loads, not just for one load, we have to adjust this level here. And this is done, again, in a very similar way, uh, looking at the output, comparing it to a reference, multiplying it by this reference here, and getting a variable reference depending on the uh, power level that you actually need. So this will be the conventional, the first type of uh, borderline control method. As I've said, there is another method which is a bit different. The idea here is that if you turn on the transistor for a given on time, for a given on time, and given that the inductor has a certain inductance, then the peak value will be fixed. That is, T on is controlling I peak. And this is because this is the state space equation, and the I peak is V in times T on, over L. Now, V in is changing uh, sinusoidally, which is fine. So, this is the V in after rectification. And therefore, you are getting, going to have an I peak, which looks like this, and the height will be proportional to T on. That is, for a fixed T on, you're going to see this waveform. If T on will be larger, then the whole picture will go up because it will be more time and the I peak will be higher. So, in this case, we are, again, looking for the zero, and once the zero comes in, we turn on the switch for a given T on time. The T on time is determined by a PWM modulator, actually. This is a, a triangular waveform, which is compared to a fixed voltage. Let's assume that it is fixed now. So, therefore, it's going to produce a fixed T on, and once this T on uh, ends, then it'll reset the flip-flop and turn on the, off the transistor. So, after a zero detection, there's a T on, depending on this value. And then at the end of T on, of course, the I peak is reached, and again, we have a discharge of the inductor. Again, in order to accommodate different loads, we have to adjust this level here, which is adjusting T on, and therefore uh, we have this amplifier again, 
looking at the output, comparing to the reference, well, there's no divider here, it should be, because usually these are high voltages, and then producing this level that determines the tion. So this is the borderline concept, and as you can see, this particular case, we are not sensing the input voltage. The input voltage is affecting the peak value by the equation that I've shown you before. So we don't need a reference for the input voltage because the input voltage is determining the high peak by itself. Now another method, which is sort of a combination between the no sensing and the uh, continuous current mode, is the power factor control with no sensing of input voltage, and this is for the CCM mode, that is the ripple here is small, it's not like a borderline, but a small ripple. In this scheme, there is a measurement of the current, it could be here, or of course here, the, the same current, and the output voltage again, and a controller that turns on and off the switch. In this case, there is no voltage reference. The circuit by itself sort of again generates uh, its own reference. So let's see how this thing works. First of all, let's realize here that this voltage here, we call it V in, this is the rectified AC voltage. This voltage, which I'll call it V sub switch or SW is the voltage that you see here which has this waveform. However, the average of this waveform, the average of this waveform is V out times D off because this is D off is the duty cycle here that you see this, this pulse and therefore the average is V out times D off. So here we have V out times D off and here we have V in. Now, for a high frequency switching uh, inductor, you might say that the average voltage here and the average voltage here are almost the same. And this is the assumption we are going to make. So we have a voltage here and the average voltage here across this inductor is pretty, pretty much the same. We go now to this presentation, which is an average model in which we have V in here we have V switch here, which is generated by D off times V out, okay? And this is a, like a voltage source uh, representing this value. And then we have the output section, which is not important for our discussion. Now, as I've said, the assumption we made is that for a high frequency inductor, V in is just about equal to V switch, which is equal to D off times uh, V out. And this uh, bracket uh, denotes that this is an average, these are average values. So here we have this relationship. Now what we're going to do is just divide the two sides with the input voltage. The input So what we are going to do is to divide the two sides by the input current. The input current is the current coming into the circuit, which is the inductor current, okay? Now, this ratio here, V in over I in, is the so-called equivalent input resistance of the stage. Now, another way to look at the purpose or the function of the power factor correction circuit is to make the circuit look resistive because if you have a resistive load then the current will be sinusoidal if the input voltage is sinusoidal. So this is actually an objective of all power factor correction system to make the input look like a resistive. Okay so V in over I in is resistive is the resistor and this is the equivalent resistance that we want. And we find that this equivalent resistance is equal to D off times average of V out divided by IL. Turning things around, we can extract here a rule for D off. 
and it says that if d of will be equal to i l times r e over v out, and this is the r e that we want, then the circuit will behave as a resistor, as a resistor in terms of the uh, input terminals. So in this case, what we are doing, we are generating a d off according to this rule. Okay, so we measure the current. This is this component here, and we multiply it by a constant that represents R e over v out. You might say this is the constant, and generating here d off. This is a sort of a PWM modulator that generates this d off, or the d off of this generator is proportional to i l times some constant which represents this value. Again, since r e has to change according to the load, then we have a multiplier here, and we measure the output voltage compared to a reference, and change this level, which multiplies i l, this is this factor here, to adjust actually r e to what we need in terms of the load. In this case, we are not sensing the input voltage. We are just measuring the current. This will be in the CCM mode. Ripple will be low. And this is a way to control the input equivalent resistance, which is in fact the objective of a power factor. Now the circuit requires a multiplier to multiply the IL by this value here for adjustment of RE and the current at the input. This multiplier can be made very simple because we need here a modulator. So actually it can be combined with the modulator. And the way to do it is uh, to have the slope of this modulator adjustable. So for a given slope of this modulator, for a VE, which is this value, we're going to have, this will be the T off, and this will be the T on. Now, if there is a need for a change, and say the VE becomes higher, then this will be the higher value, because uh, we are going to change the slope, that is, the multiplication is done by actually changing the slope of this uh, modulator, and Therefore, the intersection will be at a different point, and now T off will be larger, and T on, of course, will be smaller. So this is a neat way uh, to overcome the multiplier problem, because in all other circuits, the multiplier has to be an analog multiplier, which is a fairly uh, complex circuit. Now, here is an example how this can be achieved. This is a current source which is controlled by the differences between the output and the reference. So this is a controlled current source which feeds a capacitor, and therefore as this current changes, the slope will change, and this is actually do the job. So this, is, in fact, is the modulator with a variable current source depending on the output voltage, or the deviation, I should say, of the output voltage from the target voltage. In reality, this could be done very simply. Uh, you have a current mirror here, uh, which generates actually a, a constant current, but then you modulate it, or change the value by injecting a current into this uh, junction, and this will change the current here, this will change the slope, and you compare this value, you compare it by these divider to the current across RS, which is measuring the current of the circuit, and the different go to a comparator, which keeps the, the transistor on and off. So this is really a very simple uh, way to do it. This is, in fact, uh, been uh, described in a patent of 2001. And details of this uh, method of control can be found in these two uh, paper. There is a paper of uh, 1998 and another paper at uh, 1999, and I'll put a link to these papers that you can download at the uh, comment section of the YouTube clip. 
This brings me to the end of this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have found this presentation interesting and maybe it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you.